all for joining us for this Talks at Google event, welcoming the cast and creatives of the sensational off-Broadway show, Titanic. <laughs> yes. My name is Mike Bufano, and I lead our Pride at Google employee resource group here in New York City. Uh, before we dive into chatting with our illustrious panel of guests, uh, some of our cast will be performing some numbers from the show. If you are new to the world of Titanic here, however, uh, I'd like to give you a bit of an introduction. When the music of Celine Dion makes sweet Canadian love with the 11-time Oscar-winning film Titanic, you get Titanic, a musical celebration that turns one of the greatest love stories of all time into a hysterical and joyful sleigh fest. Featuring powerhouse voices and show-stopping numbers, Titanic is a one-of-a-kind musical voyage bursting with nostalgia and heart. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage current and former members of the cast to perform a few of the show's numbers. Hi, guys. Used to be that I believed in something Used to be that I believed in love It's been a long time since I've had that feeling I could love someone I could trust someone I said I never want to want my heart again, darling I said I'd never let nobody in but if you ask me to I just might change my mind and let you in my life forever if you ask me to I just might give my heart and stay here in your arms forever if you ask me to When we get to New York, I want you to teach me how to ride horses and spit like a man. <laughs> I mean, why do men always get to spit and women always have to swallow? It's unfair. Wait, they didn't teach you how to spit in finishing school? Mm. Here, <laughs> it's easy. Somehow ever since I've been around you Can't go back to being on my own Can't help feeling darling since I found you so much it's good to see you thank you oh my god my bra came off I was dancing my bra came off okay who wants to hear another song what do you think okay maestro can you hear it please you know this song right it's my favorite song in the whole world Oh, oh, oh. 
so much. I love you so much. should have called you first, but I was dying to get to you. I was dreaming while I drove the long train road ahead. Uh-huh, yes. Could taste your sweet kisses, your arms open wide. This fever for you is just burning me up inside. I drove all night. your sleep to make love to you is that all right what in this world keeps us from falling apart no matter where i go i hear the beating of our one heart i think about it when the night is cold and dark uh -huh, yes no one can move me the way that you do. Nothing erases this feeling between me and you. I drove all night to get to you. Is that all right? I drove all night, crept in your room, wake you from your sleep. To make love to you Is that all right? I drove all night
just resetting, everybody. Perfect. This is all going to be cut from the recording. OK. <laughs> all right. Well, we can welcome our panelists. Well, come on up. I guess we should have preface. Are you going to go over this? I guess we should have prefaced. She's Celine Dion. I'm Jack. She's Rose. He plays our captain, which slash Victor Garber. Um, so yeah, and those, we don't know these. And three we people. have no yeah. idea. Hi, we're seat filler. Who are yeah. we? Yeah. Well, before we dive into intros, just to acknowledge the two folks who performed who are not on the panel. So we have Carrie St. Louis as Rose. Anthony Murphy as Victor Garber slash the captain. Yeah. And let's give it up one more time for the performance just overall. That was amazing. Woo! And so customized for Google. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but I'd love to just go down the line, have you all introduce yourself and your affiliation with the production. Hi, I'm Marla Mandel. I play Celine Dion, as you know. And uh, I also co-wrote the, the book with Connie and Ty. Uh, I'm Constantine Rasuli, a.k.a. Connie. I play Jack Dawson and uh, one of the co-authors. Uh, my name's Ty Blue, co-author and director of Titanic. Hello, Google. My name is Eleanor Scott, and I am the choreographer for Titanic. Hi, everybody. My name is Eva Price, and I am the producer of Titanic. Amazing. So great to have you all here. It is such a unique show that, as you all know, I've seen thrice. How many of you have in the audience have seen it? OK. Yeah. Yes. Heck yes. If you haven't, we're all looking at you, and you should go get tickets. Um, but I would love for you all to just paint a picture of the timeline. So from its inception, the idea, to where it is now, and where you all kind of came into the process in your various roles. Wow. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. Um, Sorry. Hi, so let's go back seven years yeah. ago um, to when we were broke ass artists in LA trying to be on TV. And we moved from New York all thinking that you know we were going to be on TV tomorrow. Um, that didn't happen. Um, so we were working at this <laughs> wonderful. Still hasn't. Still hasn't. Working at this wonderful um, uh, immersive Supper dinner club. theater. Supper club. For $75 a show, we were doing parody musicals to a movie to musicals. Um, and it just, it was a random one night. I was drunk at a bar with her. We were doing a parody of Scream. And I was looking around and I was like, wow, this show sucks. Um, <laughs> we really need to write our own stuff. And I was like, Marla, how about. I like, Marla, I have an idea. Yeah. Two martinis deep. I was like, the next show I'm going to do is going to be Titanic. You're going to play Celine Dion. I'm going to be Jack. And I think it's going to work. And she was like, <laughs> good luck, queen. Never going to happen. Um, I shot it down real fast. Yeah. I was like, we're doing dinner theater. That's like pretty much it for me. Like, I could see myself doing this forever. But two years later, <laughs> two years later, we sat on the idea. We did nothing with it because we're like actors in LA. We're not going to get together and write anything. No. Well, I did write an outline. I went home that night and wrote an outline, and I put all the songs where they, where they went in the show. But then two years went by. And you told me about it like that day too, and I was like, "Huh, that's a good idea." And then I, I pitched it to the powers that be at the venue where we were doing shows, and they were like, "Yeah, it's not like good. that's so stupid." And I said, that's "Okay, well, girl. screams good. Get out of here." <laughs> so yeah, so two years go by. We do nothing. <laughs> Two years go by, we do absolutely, <laughs> absolutely nothing, nothing with our lives. And then, and then we get a text one day from Ty. It was right after the 2016 election. Ty was feeling morose, and he was like, we have to do this. The time is now. And, and the entire time, I was like, oh my god, this seems like so much work. I do not want to do this, LOL, LOL. But we started getting together every Monday night, and we would just write for fun. He lived in this luxury building that had I will a, never live in a place like yeah, that Yeah, it was again. so expensive, but he had a movie theater. So he would rent out the movie theater, and we would go, and we would start just working on it and doing writing sessions. And so we put up a reading which led to another reading, which led to another reading. And all of a sudden, these people were coming to see it. And we were like, well, maybe this is actually good. And through the course of doing the readings, we uh, reconnected with Eva Price, the producer, 
And she famously said, <laughs> you guys, I'm just coming for fun. Like, I don't I'm actually want to. I'm just your friend. I'm, I have no intention of producing this. <laughs> like, don't even think yeah. about it. I'm just she coming like, as a friend. Don't even think like, about yeah. it. And so Connie was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. cool, cool tight, tight, tight. You know, Connie, he's just like suave and smooth. And he's just, you know, kind of Insane. a devil behind the eyes. And um, Eva saw it. And she was like, well, I <laughs> she was like, oh, shit, I got to do it now. <laughs> Enter true. Eva Price. Enter Eva true. Price. True, true, true. All of that is true. And yeah, and then we um, got a venue and cast the show, and it was February 2020, and we were going to open in June, Yay. and we were ra we'd raised all the money. It was like a perfect plan. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to. Um, feeling really sad and really despondent, and I was feeling... Actually, I was feeling really bad for these guys because they had a plan. They were giving up their houses. They were moving to New York. They were set to do this, and I couldn't tell them when they could do it. So I don't know. I don't know if they realize this, but I orchestrated <laughs> a like a monthly or bi-monthly kind of Zoom work session for them to get online and like work on the show and discuss how they would stage it. And meanwhile, we were trying to get song rights and clear rights and all of that, which we can get to later. Um, and we would lose songs and not get them, so they'd have to rewrite that scene and reconceive it. And, you know, in some ways, I thought it might inspire them to like keep going and have something to look forward to as theater artists. We really didn't for those that year and a half. But it also made the show better. And then we were lucky enough to put up a live stream of the show. Because remember when you could like not have audiences there, but put it on YouTube? <laughs> and enter Eleanor, who we had hired before the pandemic as well, um, but never got a chance to, to collaborate with everyone until that live stream in April of 2021. And then we opened uh, on, uh, at the asylum June of 22 and transferred to the Daryl Roth November of 22, and here we are taking over the world. Thank you. <laughs> Woohoo! With your help, Google, with your help. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, I'm glad that you alluded to the song rights, because as someone who's not in the biz, when you go to a show like this, it's like, how do they get the rights to Celine's music? Can you describe what that process was like? In the beginning. <laughs> We had zero rights, had zero and rights. so we were just doing it and hoping that if it was good enough, that we would get like a producer that could actually like do things legally. So in the beginning, we were <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we were, were just you know we were just like doing it. So we 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 were doing it at these cabaret spaces that had these ASCAP licenses over the songs. So we were good, but if we had to license it commercially, commercially and professionally, we had to really engage a lawyer. And so thankfully, Eva is the queen of this, having done you know Jagged Little Pill and and Juliet and. Had cruel intentions and cruel intentions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Carrie and, and I were in that. Hey, Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Eva and and her relationship to the lawyer, which you can speak about. Then. Yeah. I mean, I think the joke is, I think you actually still needed the rights at your dinner theater, but <laughs> you we turned a blind eye. <laughs> you were like, what? But ask just, forgiveness later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that was our motto. It's not as it's not as policed. Um, yeah. There, I mean, there's it's challenging, of course, but there's some incredible music clearance companies and people. And shout out right now to the Queen who does this for Rock of Ages and named the musical Janet Billing Rich, a genius based in Los Angeles. And her and her team, Manage This Media, came in and helped us clear the songs that we have on the show. And it did not hurt that the greatest songwriter, producer of Celine Dion and many other classics, David Foster, had come and seen one of the readings that, that these guys had put up and fell in love with it and was very supportive as a co-writer on many of the songs. Which was a surreal evening in itself, yeah. yeah. But we did we did lose some of the songs too. Yeah. So you know we lost like all coming back to me now, and we lost uh, that's the way it is, and we lost the power of love. And at first we were like, oh my god, what are we gonna do? Like this is gonna ruin the show. But thankfully, her her, her discography is so huge and massive, and she has so many hits that You're we talking Celine or me? Sorry, uh, you. <laughs> we're talking about you. Yeah, you. Yeah. High belt. Over yeah, here. yeah. And um, and then Celine and her discography is is so massive and huge that we were able to kind of <laughs> like retrofit different songs, which actually work just as well, if not better. So it all worked out. It's amazing. Well, speaking of the songs, I think that the the parts 
that you all demonstrated earlier and, and others in the show require like real vocal chops, as anyone who's tried to do Selena at karaoke will know. <laughs> They're not easy songs, um, but also there's quite a bit of physical comedy. So how did you kind of bring about the marrying of the physicality and the choreography um, of the show to match the tracks and the hilarious writing? I think that's Eleanor. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah we'll share this one. Yeah. Um, my vision for the show was always a, a pop-up Celine Dion concert where she mysteriously marionettes these incredible comedian singers uh, who start as tour guests at the Titanic Museum. She breaks into the, the, the uh, museum and the power of her actual vocal cords <laughs> shift them on a cellular level into her personal puppets for her story <laughs> hour. That is the concept of Titanic. Um, yeah, so everybody had to be a stellar vocalist because yes. we have to pay homage to this catalog. It is hard to sing. That's why she's a star. So to get cast in the show, you got to be able to sing. But in the sense of it being like an homage to her Vegas residency visually, um, as I told Eleanor when we were first meeting, I was like, I don't want this to be dancey dancey. I want it to feel like concert movement that Celine might be able to step into with these puppets that she's uh, manufactured. And so that was kind of the beginning of figuring out choreo. But I will say, you know, we, we workshopped this thing on our own for so long. And a lot of the physical movement, it literally just came out of what especially he would do because he's, he's like a, Physical unwell. comedian genius. <laughs> um, unwell. Unwell. He's That's also called unwell. It's called mental illness. But we love him. <laughs> you know, it just it was it, sort of the 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 charactery acting physicalizations came out of years of just natural workshopping and letting them do what they do, and then Eleanor came in for you know to flush out the musical numbers mm -hmm. and. And I feel like because so much of like the development of the show was done in readings, which was done stood behind music stands. The th things that were developing in terms of choreography were so gestural that I was like, that's something that we can t like bring in and take in. So all these kind of like step touches, these like like arms, we have amazing background vocalists in our show that are Celine's backup singers. So they are fully standing with their microphones, period, going woof, right? And so how can we engage that and also sometimes make things look like they're in like a music video. So a lot of the choreography feels like you're watching a Celine Dion music video, which by the way, go 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 rewatch those if you haven't in a long time because they're fucking amazing. Yeah. So uh, truly inspired by what they brought physically in terms of their characters, but also trying to make the show feel like a concert. Mm. So the next subject might be a little bit touchy, okay? Because in January of 2023, Rolling Stone Magazine put out an article of the 200 best singers of all time. And there was one pop icon diva who is notably absent from this list. I would like to give us an opportunity to process, respond, what? Pissed. Yeah. How yeah. dare you? I'm hurt. Absolutely. Hurt and How angry. dare you? And utterly pissed. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> I thought it was like a TikTok trend, like let's drag Celine, and you know what I mean. I don't, I was so deeply confused by it all. I was like, this can't be real. And then I had that click moment. We were like, oh wait, no, they actually did. They actually published this. Um, it was shocking. It was shocking. I was actually genuinely angry and upset. Well, same. Correct? Yeah. She's yeah. the greatest, greatest singer, singer of all time. Yeah. Like one of the, the goats, greatest even. vocalists of all time. Sorry, now I'm like going off. You guys <laughs> actually upset. Angry at it. Go off, sis. <laughs> but you know what's funny about what's fun about our show is that there's an element of improv it, for for those who have seen it, and so sometimes we can kind of go off the cuff with like you know whatever's happening in the news. And so the the character that plays Rose's mother, Ruth, went off about it in his like giant monologue, and the audience went like fucking lit for it. <laughs> they they sorry, I curse, but but that so I feel like in our own way we we <laughs> took revenge. Oh, yeah. In the yes. way that we knew how, which is through art. You know what I mean? <laughs> and our and our kick revenge. ass social media team decided to create the greatest GIF meme video, whatever you want to call it, whatever the kids call it. That was just 200 different images of Celine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Rolling Stone's greatest singer of all time above it. And it was probably my most favorite social media moment of my lifetime. Yeah. Period. It was wild. I, I, I went on Good Morning America to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's 
Right. They literally like, we need you to be to give us some sound bites about how upset you are about this. I was like, bitch, I have so many. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. I'm on Good Morning America talking about this list. Okay, go like, off. And another thing. Also, <laughs> I think I was like, these songs require a vocal gymnast. Yeah. Who else? Anyway, I went in. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we were upset. We were upset. Yeah. Strongly worded letters to the editor, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Marla, next question's for you. So, uh -oh. you originated the role <laughs> of Celine. Uh -oh. yeah. Well, it's, it's not just the vocals, but the energy, the embodiment of what she's bringing. And, in fact, as the narrator, you don't really interact with our other characters. No, you not at all. You don't have, like, stage partners. So, no. So, how did you go about preparing for the role? Did you go down, like, the <laughs> biggest ra rabbit hole of, of YouTube material? Do you dream as Celine sometimes? Like, I what, do. I have dreams about the show. All, I had a dream the other night. All, yeah. And then I had a dream that I lost 500 uh, Instagram followers within the context of the show. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> when, um, when we first started it, when Connie was like, you're going to be Celine. I was like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. That. And um, I was too. I was scared. I was really scared because she is the greatest singer of all time, and I grew up listening to her. She was my. She was my like diva icon. You know, trying to belt all by myself in my bedroom and cracking every single time when I was thirteen. That's another thing. But um, I, I would not watch her in the beginning. I couldn't. I was too scared because I was. I was convinced I would butcher her so much. Um, and in the beginning, I kind of did TBH until. We got more serious about it, and then I was like, if I am really going to do this, if people are going to watch me do this <laughs> commercially, I have to I have to invest and learn every single thing about her. And so then, yes, I went into the, the world's greatest Celine Cahill on Instagram you have ever seen. <laughs> now my algorithm is all Celine, which I love. So I would, like, wake up. It was like, like you know, you'd, like, text your boyfriend, I look at Celine in the morning, and, uh, and I also look at her <laughs> going to bed, and I would watch every interview. I would watch every single song, and I would learn, like, she has her own very specific vocabulary of, like, chess beats and, like, face and, like, little, like, she's, like, conducting an orchestra, and she's always, like, you know, she's always, like, in, like, plie. A little light just, plie, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, just... Yeah, give us some, Marla. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Please. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then it just got more and more specific, and, and to your point about... Um, about interacting with the audience. I have, yes, Celine has no scene partner. She is like the MC of cabaret, but like on crystal meth because <laughs> <laughs> it's like next level. But you know, but what I will say is what really, really helped us is working at that shitty dinner theater. We had to interact with the audience all the time. You know, we would be belting our faces off and then like eating one of their truffle french fries and drinking their wine pre pandemic. So it, it just, you, we made the audience feel included, and so that's 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 why I think <laughs> I have become an expert at interacting with audience members and no cast members. <laughs> but you should also consider doing stand up. I think because it's like the skill set is Period. high. Yes. Oh my god! Exactly right. Well, I would die. I would die on stage. <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> next question. Yeah. So, as you alluded to before, and some of my favorite parts of the show are the, the improv parts. And I feel like the times I've seen it, I leave and my, my face just hurts because I'm just like <laughs> grinning, laughing. What are your favorite parts of the show to either perform or watch or like that you're like, yes, like that is the one? I mean, the, the improv, improv is, is so special. And again, that's because we didn't know what to write because we were just like working in his movie theater. <laughs> and, LOL. And I we will didn't never be do. able to afford that again. So please, yeah, yeah. Google, get me a job. <laughs> Same. And he was like, they were like, t I remember, I will never forget, we were doing a reading, we had no idea what to do, and they were like, Marla, just like, just make something up, just like, can you just do something, just improv. And and that has become, in, in a wild twist, one of the most fun things about the show, because every time you come, you will never, ever see the same improv twice. Now, do I want to die every day trying to come up with material? <laughs> yeah, that's it's, it's hard, but it has... It's definitely, I think, the most exciting thing to watch. They don't know what I'm going to say. They have no idea. No one knows. Sometimes, I, I, most of the time, I don't even know <laughs> what I'm going to say. Yeah. But I think that's the, that's the magic of it, to be able to see a show. Usually when you see a show, it's like completely frozen, set in stone, and we have broken that rule. You're not going to see the same show twice. And I think that's why people come back 10, 13, 20 times to see it. Yeah, we're the anti-musical musical. musical. Um, uh, and Marla when we do this improv, we mimic what she's gonna say. So she's like puppeteering us and we're just completely lip syncing for our lives. 
Um, and it, I think that's the most fun because I truly have no idea what she's gonna do. Like once she brought out chicken fingers, I had to smack them in Carrie's face. <laughs> um, it buffalo was chicken a buffalo fingers. chicken buffalo fingers. Chicken fingers. fingers um, from Whole Foods. I mean, you name it. This crazy bitch did everything. <laughs> um, and I had to sit there and, and mimic her, and it was I think it's I think still one of my favorite parts of the show. That's it. Bye. <laughs> Well, there's so much joy you have doing it as well. I mean, as much as many nerves as you may have, but like, I think it, it almost makes the audience feel like insiders because yeah. it's inherently breaking the fourth wall when, pe when you're like, I don't know what you're trying to say, um, but super enjoyable to, to behold. Um, so while both Celine and Titanic have this mass appeal, um, the show is so unabashedly queer uh, and I love it. Oops. Um, we love queer content. We're straight. <laughs> We're yeah. all yeah. Straight. It's not queer. I wow. Don't know wow, Google, wow. About. <laughs> Way to call me out. Not gay, bro. <laughs> no homo. No homo, bro, but okay, cool. Go off. You can, you, <laughs> can you speak to how you approach that sort of content? I mean, clearly, there, it's, like, it's, like, it's like a cult queer following in New York. I know people who have been like, I've seen it 12 times, right? And that's, I, I saw and that's three, not a joke. That's like, what I said, yeah, yeah, three, yeah. three times. That's nothing, yeah. 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 So I'd love you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, speak more to that. Well, I, okay, I, so here's the thing. Because this thing started from a place of three friends just getting together to kiki and make each other laugh, and because it was like literally a self-produced one-off concert for many years that we literally just scraped together with scotch tape and hope, um, <laughs> we were, unlike many newer musicals and plays or whatever that are so product-driven, we were not ever thinking that we would be a successful production. We were unencumbered by some rulesy producing entity being like, it needs this, it needs this, it needs this sure. to sell. <laughs> We were fortunate that we had those few years to really figure out the DNA of the show and being flaming homosexuals, it was just, well, maybe not flaming, but like no, flaming. vibrant. <laughs> flaming. Vibrant homosexuals. Gays. Everything that I've ever written or directed has been very queer. And even when I was performing, everything it was all, you know, drag and that kind of bullshit. Anyway, so it was just inherent to what we thought was funny. And then Eva was like, this is genius. And she just trusted, she trusted us to know our audience innately. And, she, you know, she would come in with, like, thoughts and suggestions here and there, but she really let us create a community and, and trusted that our audience would find us. I coined a phrase, let Marla be Marla. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I didn't tell let, her that. <laughs> let her be a full-blown monster. <laughs> Let her go. And it worked. <laughs> and it worked. Lortel Award yeah. winner. Yes. 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 Uh. Marla Lortella Mandela. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're just all wildly gay. That's yeah. really what it boils down <laughs> to. That's, that's we're like, this answer. is funny for us. Hopefully, other Hopefully you laugh. Yeah, people will yeah. find it funny. And, and we didn't know. But then when people started coming in New York and people were going crazy, and then we saw that the um, <laughs> the median age of the show, the people that came to see the show were like between like 20 and 40-year-old gay people, we were like, oh, okay, I think we found our audience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but let's, let's not forget, like these 80-something-year-olds are coming, have no clue what the hell's going on, but are still living their goddamn yes. lives. Truly, yeah. truly. Yeah. And I was like, okay, cool, we did some something. Yeah, yeah. I was like, go gay. <laughs> go gay. <laughs> we do we do call it a gay football game. That's Fantasia. like yeah, it's a gay yeah, it, it feels like we are performing in a football stadium to only gay people <laughs> when we because people are cackling. I mean it's it's the most it's the most wild experience that I've ever, as a performer, have ever experienced. I mean, people are stand, giving standing ovations, singing along with us, shouting, screaming. I, it, it, it's as if I feel like we are like low budget Beyonce. Beyonce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and let's put it on that a one shirt. more time for the back. Beyonce. Beyonce. <laughs> She's here this weekend. Yeah, yeah and I'm gonna <laughs> be on stage with her, so. So the, the show has progressed from the former UCB Theater under the Gracides to now the Daryl Roth Theater off of Union Square. How, can you discuss like, uh, because it's been extended how many times? 
6,000. Right, 6, yeah. 6,000 times. times. Like, what yeah. is that process like for you all in these in these various roles? But then also uh, with changeover and cast, what is the audition process like? I imagine it's fun, but like stressful. Like how, speak more to, to those things. I mean, well, extending in itself is a crazy concept to kind of digest, you know? We'll get a phone call from, from her being like, oh, we're gonna extend four months. Four months? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think we're gonna sell that many tickets? Okay, great, let's do it. Um, but yeah, we, we hit our one year benchmark and that's, you know, doing eight shows a week, corporate friends, eight shows a week, belting your face off <laughs> is hard work. And- yes. um, Walking up those damn stairs, okay? That ain't it, kid, that ain't it, kid. <laughs> So again, if you have any sort of creative um, development positions available, we're all here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, it's 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 hard work, and most most people do like a one year contract in a musical. Uh, so when we hit that one year mark, it was like we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do this, we need to do that, which is a whole new chapter and evolution. You know, it's one thing for like just a group of friends to put on a skit for a while. But learning the language and the vocabulary and the tools that you need to provide new people to teach them what Marla built on her body has been a huge process of, of learning how, and, 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 and that comes after really digging into the required tools, mm -hmm. like uh, what someone really has to be able to do to pull off Celine Dion in a fun yet earnest way. It's, it's been Wild, and actually. I think it's like a testament to the book as well, because being able to perform the role that you originated and created is one thing, but to have the show still be so funny and so successful and people still be connected to it with new people in it just shows that the book and what you all have done is the magic, and that magic lives on in new roles and new people and our amazing understudies that take on the roles as well. Um, so I think that it's hilarious. We were looking at this space and we were like, this kind of looks like the asylum. This is kind of like, so we took a show that was very immersive where we were, you know, going through the Vols and people were entering and exiting and there were scenes that were happening back there to the Daryl Roth, which is like this beautiful proscenium. So everything is displayed out in front. We were a little nervous. We're like, is it going to work? Oh, very. It's going to be different. Sorry. And it totally works. So if you haven't come seen it, you got to come see it because it works. <laughs> it works. Well, yeah. that's a very, yeah. th thank you. Thank you for that lovely compliment. It, yeah, it's been it's been challenging, and it remains. I mean, we're literally going to auditions right, right when we after leave this because we have literally two, right two people this. leaving. Actually, Anthony, Anthony, <gasps> who sang uh, I uh, drove all night. I drove all night is going into the Wiz on Broadway. Here we are. That's right. That's Amen. right. Boom. <laughs> yes. So, Anthony, when's your last day? September 3rd is Anthony's final performance in Titanic. If you want to come uh, get the full experience uh, at the Daryl Roth, um, and also just congrats on that. Yes. Yeah. What, what was the question? <laughs> we got, What's you, it like for it to be like a long, <laughs> running, long running? Oh, it's, running a yeah. it's a lot of work. It, the it's a lot of work. My emails don't stop. Yeah. Um, and it, it's 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 a lot of maintenance. It's 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 not just like something that gets to sit. It requires a lot of work. And you don't think, I mean, we, we never thought about that. We were just no. like, oh, we'll just like do this for fun. And then we're <laughs> like, oh, it's a three month run. It'll just be fun, a yeah. three month run. And it's become, I, I mean, it's just become like a massive cult hit. And so, I mean, for us, we're, we're not in it right now. We, ha we took a break because we did it for a year. And it's, I mean, on one hand, it's been great. We're living our lives. But on the other hand, you know, I feel FOMO when I see the Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. It's a weird juxtaposition to, you know, this was our baby for eight years. And then it, it changed our lives. And now, in a way, we have to, like, let it go. You know what I mean? It's like Moses. And we put it in the river. <laughs> and just <laughs> Here's your baby. Have fun. Yeah, or that Mariah Carey bye song. Moses. Yeah. Yeah. Butterfly. It can be me. Or that one. No. Here it comes. No, the butterfly song. Mm. Butterfly. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, it's hard. Yeah. it's hard. In in an ideal world, what is next for the show? Would you take this on tour? What is the what, you know? Chromatica. To We're the moon. Taking it. <laughs> to the moon. We are taking it to Chromatica. Eva has gotten a ship ready. <laughs> Limited engagement on Mars. Yeah. On Mars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I don't know, Eva. Yeah, yes to all of that, of course. <laughs> um, listen, all of all of the possibilities are possible. 
We love the idea of a, <laughs> of a global rollout. So we're working on uh, new productions in, in other territories, soon to be announced once we figure out where. Oh, crrr. Eva Price for president. Yes, yeah, save it. <laughs> All of the Eva possibilities are possible. Taking over that. the world. How's Our that for vagueness? Global <laughs> How about global domination? Diplomacy. Yeah, Theatrical love diplomacy. Love it. Listen, the good, the good news is this show actually is for everyone. Like, literally, from maybe not your five-year-old, but certainly from your 13-year-old to your 93-year-old. So we're excited about bringing it to all sorts of new audiences and new cities because we actually think it'll bring joy and people need that everywhere. And Preach. we really want to live our Lin-Manuel Miranda lives, so <laughs> tell your friends, <laughs> okay? All right, I have one more question for this crew. If you're in the room and you want to ask questions, there are mics in either of the aisles, oh. so you can Ooh, with light. With light. to make your way up. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get to you. And if there are many people on one side, go to the other side. There's no one there. We're gonna, we gotta bounce back and forth. Um, so Titanic is truly one of a kind. Um, what has made working on the show special, unique, in a way that uh, you have not experienced in your other, in your other projects? I mean, I mean, just getting to do something with friends. Yeah. I mean, we were all struggling actors, writers, directors. And the fact that we did this simply to like have fun and to now experience such joy and success doing it with your friends I is something that I don't think happens very often. So I am just so blessed that the first thing that we ever got off the ground <laughs> commercially is with people that I, I truly love and, and respect. That's been the most special thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can agree to that. I mean, these two have been with me for, I mean, Marla for 15 years, this one for 10. I mean, Carrie's also my other best friend, like 10 years, she's my muse. Um, my muse, as I cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, to and also to, to have your first project be something that nobody is telling you exactly how to do it, what to do, you need to you know, put your left foot on four, your taint on five, and you have to wave, <laughs> wave on the seven, and it's like, we've all been these cogs in a wheel. Sorry, Wicked. Um, I, was, I was in that for on and off 10 years, and it was just like, there's, there's no fun anymore. So like, to have f actual fun and to have uh, an amazing audience that you're breaking the fourth wall with and, and just literally not have it, no, no rules, truly, <laughs> which is very, very, very rare in this business. So I'm very thankful for that. I call it medicine because life is tough and being a producer in the American theater right now can be hard and a little sad and maybe depressing. So I just go to Titanic. And I feel better. And it doesn't hurt that I live down the block from the theater. So I, I go a little more often than I should. And it, it's, it just actually makes me a little more optimistic and happy. Yeah, because for also for me, going down that is like, when I have family come, I'm always doing the like, what show should we go see? And like, always number one, I'm like, I'm gonna bring him to Titanic because you will connect to something in the show. And, and the thing that I love too about the show that's so special is that like, I think sometimes when you hear like parody or something, it's just like a gag. But when you come see the show, you are blown away by talent, by the song. It sounds so beautiful. It looks amazing and you'll laugh, laugh your tits off, truly. <laughs> so like, it is always the number one show that I bring my friends and my family to. And then they always, like I have friends that have seen the show literally five times because it is just special to them. So it's, it's truly amazing to share that with people I love. I mean, yes to all of that. It's, it's really thrilling to know that something that you've worked really hard on brings thousands of people sheer joy every week, and that's something that is crucial to survival, especially coming out of the pandemic. Um, I mean, on a personal level, I've tried to like pivot out of show business so many times, um, <clears throat> and the pandemic like really w ironed that in for me, um, but I held space for this project because she was interested and because I thought, well, we spent all this time on this, let's just give this one go, and then I was ready to go like work for an advertising company in DC. Um, couldn't get interview. Um, Drag them. But, um, Drag them. In any event, um, for someone who like, uh, when I performed back many years ago, 
I, I got really tired of doing the same thing, the exact same thing eight times a week, feeling like that cog in motion. And so I pivoted to directing because I wanted to create and use my brain more. And it's nice to see that wanting to have more of a freer form experience for both the actors and the, the crowd is something that it seems like other people want too. You know what I mean? People need that freshness when they go to a theater. And um, so it's nice to get to to not have to pivot away from directing and know that like, oh, maybe I can create a successful show in this business after all. So it's it's gratifying in many ways. Thank you for those answers. Um, we will pivot to the mic for questions. Hi, Mike. First of all, thank you all so much for being here, bringing your belt to Google at what, like <laughs> noon on a Tuesday? That was great, thank you not so really. much. Thank you for getting it. Well. Um, for each of you, maybe this was different. Maybe there wasn't one moment, but did any of you have like one night, one audience that really sold it for you? Like, oh, this is like really happening. Um, many, many moments. But was there like one audience that really put you over the edge of like, this is, this is a thing now? Uh, yeah, hi. <laughs> we were talking about it. We, we both have, like, we actually have different. Different ones. You yeah. go first. No, you go, you go, you go. Okay, I will. Um, <laughs> there was, I, I will never forget this one night um, after every single, every single number, people got up right here. Um, was that after we won the Lord Tell? Doesn't matter. It was around that time, and people went ape shit. They were standing up, screaming after every single musical number. And then at the end, when Marla's singing this one part where she's introducing, the, or like you know, it's like basically our send off to introduce the characters or to say goodbye to the characters. They all started clapping one by one, just for everyone, all, all of our solos. Um, and that was just so special. I don't know why it really got us that night, but it was crazy. Oh, I, I was that crazy when night? I cried. When you cried, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I cried. Yeah, I remember. I came out and I was looking at the audience, and I just I, I started crying, and then I looked down, and then everyone was crying because I, I it was just one of the most surreal moments to be like, oh my god. I was going to say the first preview, the very very first preview at the asylum. W I was like, but I could not even hear. That's how loud people were laughing and, and clapping, and so that was a real like, oh my god, wait, we might be on to something. <laughs> Here and then and then Josh Eva's uh, one Eva's like secondhand man came up and he was like this is the best first preview <laughs> that we've ever experienced as producers in our lifetime and I was like okay okay I think we have something here so yeah those those two moments for me yeah, yeah. thank you hey. thank you great question <laughs> hi uh, big fan of the show thank you so much for making it um, my question is has Celine seen it or has she interacted with you oh at God all? if she did I would die. <laughs> she would die. <laughs> I always say, like, I would probably faint, and then she would come on stage and be like, okay, let's go. And she would do the exact, <laughs> it would be the exact same show somehow. Do you know what I mean? It's like when Beyonce walks over Michelle, and she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. literally, that's what Celine would do to Marla. Yeah. No, sadly, Celine has not come. I mean, for me, I would, I, I would die. I mean, I'm like one of her biggest fans. But, I mean, David Foster, who wrote all of her songs, has come. Her backup dancers, her makeup artist, her publicist, uh, her physician. I, I mean, literally, literally, her, her doctor from Canada came. I, I, every single person from her inner circle has seen it. And the beauty of it is, is that every single person who has has said to us, she would absolutely love this. She has such a good sense of humor and she has such a good heart that she would just love it. So I, you know, it's been in the news recently that she's been ill and I just hope, you know, that she knows that we are continuing her legacy with, with honor to her because we truly, this came out of a place of wanting to do something, but we actually just <laughs> view her as our icon. She's yeah, our diva. It's a love letter. It's a love yeah. letter to her and yeah. her whole persona. Yeah. And we just, it's truly a send off for her and we love yeah. her. Yeah. So everyone but her has seen it. <laughs> I went to Vegas, uh, to do some meetings and managed somehow to get a meeting with her producers from Caesars who have been with her for 20 years. And I'm nervous as shit, obviously, to be in the room with the people who are managing her career, who are interested in the show, and they're just like, everybody's talking about your show. Mm -hmm. Everybody in Vegas wants to go see your show. It sounds so great. And he's like, we can tell that you are doing this because you love her. We appreciate the way you guys lift up the brand and keep us afloat in a way while she's not able to perform. So thank God we have a very good relationship with Team Celine. Yeah. Yeah. Team Celine. And they've seen it, yeah. <laughs> so we have folks who are also tuned in virtually, so I'm gonna take a virtual question. <laughs> so from Blair in New York, truly obsessed with the show. Thank you for being here. If you could add a song or scene to the current show, what would it be? 
Well, oh. <laughs> we lost All Coming Back to Me Now. That was like our original that opening was number. Because unfortunately, Meatloaf. Passed. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It was written for Meatloaf by Jim Steinman, and in a and in a different Meatloaf show. So we lost that. I would love if that one came back. However, it's a beast to sing, so I'm kind of like, oh, maybe it's a, maybe it's okay <laughs> that we don't have it. But yeah, that would be mine. All coming back to me now. Probably same. Yeah, yeah. it was a beautiful opening. Yeah, yeah all coming back to me the, just really. It's all coming back. Yeah. But <laughs> our opening number is really cute still. Oh, I love it. You know I what I mean? I love it. it. Work. Yeah, and it's easier vocally. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and we never yeah. actually performed it because we never had the rights, guys. <laughs> right, that's we never right. did. Um, yeah, that's right. Oh, we yeah. never did. We, cool. Um, we sure. never did. Definitely it's doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, minds. I don't know what you're talking about. Magic in, la minds. in magic land back here. Yeah, yeah, we just wanted it. So we really wanted it. <laughs> All right, back to the mic over here. Never did. <laughs> I can't take them anywhere. Oh, his light. <laughs> His light went out. There it is. There it is. Gorgeous. Oh. Gorgeous. Um, thank you guys so, so much for coming. This is literally like the treat of a lifetime. You are the best. You make so many people happy. You brought such joy to the community and New York City. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Um, thank you. What I was going to ask, Marla and Connie, huge fans. I uh, thank love you. your banter and your relationship is so awesome. Um, what do you call us? What do I call us? Yeah. Oh, non-sexual non life, life partners. partners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they li they are roommates, and we live together. Really? And they were roommates. So <laughs> it's sick. All, our parents are always like, "You guys should just get married," and I'm like, "Honestly, that's we what's probably, probably gonna happen." <laughs> <laughs> In a sick and twisted way. I'll shoot myself. Please don't. No. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. No, I loved all of that. Um, so. Uh, can you talk about, like, you've had so much success in such, like, a brief period, and you invite everyone along to, like, the intimacy of your actual lives? Like, what has the celebrity experience been like for you? And, like, coming to terms with being recognized? <laughs> Just LOL, off. celebrity experience. I mean, thank he, you. Well, okay, the celebrity experience is kind of wild because he gets recognized literally <laughs> everywhere. We went to Greece and he got recognized in Greece. Yep. No one knows who the fuck I am. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows. It's because she's not wearing the wig. And I'm like, the wig's blonde, you're a redhead, and yeah. nobody cares. Um, <laughs> I, I will say this, the, the, it, it has been truly crazy. I mean, the last week, um, right before we left, LOL. What is this? <laughs> we just, also, do you see our outfits? We literally yeah. wearing the same fucking clothes. Yeah. <laughs> the last week, uh, right before we took a break, there were so many huge celebrities in the audience. I mean, we had like Amy Schumer, Billy Eichner, Jane Cesley Krakowski. Strong, Jane Lauren Krakowski, Michaels. Lauren Michaels from SNL, the president of CBS. There were so many huge people coming to see this little off-Broadway show, and I was crying after every show. I was crying in the cab home, because we share cabs cab home. home. And I was like, <laughs> look, look at what we have done. It's, it's just so crazy. And I feel like the whole year has been, frankly, I mean, it's been incredible. It's also been, you know, doing a show is exhausting. So I feel like I, I would never have a chance to process anything until we were in the cab rides <laughs> home yeah. where I was sobbing to Connie and holding his hand being like look at what we've done and we've made so it has been um it's been a wild experience I mean uh, honestly like before the pandemic bef uh, during the pandemic waiting for the show I was living at home you know with my family so from a year going from living at home with my family being a video editor to to now still living kind of me. yeah living with him still kind of being a video editor but having <laughs> this wonderful product it, it's been a life-changing year and I can only imagine what's going to happen in the next two to three years with the course of the show. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Keep Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to do one last question in the room. Great. Oh. Thank you so much for being here. I've been looking forward to this and loved the show. Saw it in September at the asylum. Um, and so um, my question is around constraints. We work at Google. It's great. But sometimes we have constraints too, whether it's time or budget or tech limitations. People are nodding. Yes. So having been to the asylum, and you all are in the Roth now, what was the most challenging thing in working in that tiny space? Now, besides, I know, Marla, you said on Las Culturistas that the rats were a problem. But besides the rats. <laughs> um, the rats well, were a problem. Yeah. They were <laughs> What great. was the most we challenging thing? It's because Gristidis closed. So the, it, we were underneath the, uh, the Gristidis, and when it closed, all the rats came down to the basement. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah Leaving yeah. wonderful little things on our dressing room station. Yeah, but there are rats in Broadway theaters, too. Rats are just like a thing. You just like see a rat like all the time. You're like, hey. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're like, hey, rat. It's not specific How's that pizza? in your mouth. Yeah. Cool. What um, was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Constraints. 
constraint. Oh, well, I'll say this. I've worked in enough shitty venues to know that like I gotta go and be in it a lot and let it let the room speak to me about how to make its flaws my attributes that that help us. So when I moved back to New York from living at home over the pandemic, I would go to the asylum and watch the comedy shows there from every seat that I could get in the house. And I just started to learn about the flaws of the space and the charm of the space and um, just you know, it was a cement block mm -hmm. in a basement. Horrible for sound. Your sound people are amazing, by the way. Thank you. <clears throat> Horrible for sound, so I really like strategized and got granular with my sound designer about a way to make that type of space work, and he did a brilliant job. And then also, in terms of staging, how to make something that's, you know, kind of like this room, but not good. There were three uh, pillars work. in the way, too, which was Yeah, it's all, about, it's all about doing the math of the room. It's all about geometry and figuring out what areas serve the room the best. So it was a lot of that for me in, in the pre-production phase. And then that all changed. The math all changes when you transfer to a proscenium uh, venue. But so the challenge there was keeping the charm and the intimacy while letting it while letting the scale become grand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eleanor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We had done dinner. We had done like such bad dinner theater where it we were like eating on pe and like singing on people's laps. So like coming to the like the asylum honestly was like a huge step up for us. And we knew that if we could do anything at the dinner theater, we could take this show and the show would be so good no matter what. So, and and I mean talk about constraints. When we did when we started this, we had zero money. I mean this was funded on a credit card that he took yeah. out. Yeah. So we had absolutely no finances to put this together. And I that's, made I think, every prop. He made every from prop. Michaels. Yeah yeah yeah. Like literally literally. The heart of the ocean. The yeah. heart of the ocean and scrappy as hell. I rented my dress on Rent the Runway every single time. I must have wasted thousands of dollars on a, on a gold dress from Rent the Runway. There was just no <laughs> money. But I think, actually, it, it benefited us in the end because what we have is such an intimate, kind of scrappy, fun feel at, now on this glorious, beautiful stage. But we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never want to... Well, something that we all feel uh, in, in full agreement on is that, especially when you go to a Broadway show nowadays, they're so overproduced, right? It, you're, there, there's no room for you to use your imagination. There's no negative space for you to engage your imagination and paint the rest of the picture in what you feel and what you see in your spirit. And so I always wanted it to be something that was scrappy enough that your imagination was engaged so that you had a personal experience because there's so much nostalgia to pull from with this material. Um, but also, how can we... How can we keep that element, but also exceed people's expectations of what they think a parody in a basement's gonna be? And so it's always about balancing those two elements for me. Yeah, highbrow, lowbrow. Yeah. Mix it up. I think we gotta let Google go back to work. <laughs> no. Yeah. no. Well, cardboard oh, patty was my favorite prop, so. Oh, oh. thank you. Hey, cardboard um, patty. She's still there. Thank you all so much for being here. It has been truly a joy. <laughs> thank you, Google. Thanks, Google. Thank you, Google. Thank you, Google. Thank you, Google. Can Bye. I get a phone? <laughs> Can I get a phone? I'm kidding. But I'm and not. thank you all for being here, for tuning in. We'll see you soon.